What's up, y'all? Hope you're having the best day ever. My name is Ruben Bowlby. This is Zachary Zoe. We're here for the Theory of Everything, talking about education today. Um, earlier today, as I was continuing to explore this topic, I came across a TED Talk um, that I've seen before. Um, a good friend of, my sent it, uh, of mine sent it to me. Um, and in that TED Talk, he discusses um, how creativity may be stifled by our current educational system. Um, he said that kids aren't afraid to be wrong and the system that we have today might be taking that away from them. Um, he believes that if you aren't prepared to be wrong, uh, you won't be, ever come up with anything original. Um, he actually uh, referred to Picasso saying that all kids are artists um, and they're, they're born artists, but uh, they grow out of it. Um, Zach, what do you think about that? I think he raises a fair point. Whenever you experiment, you risk the possibility of failure. And if you deny yourself that opportunity, then you're going to stunt your growth. So, so there's certainly some merit in his opinion. Mm -hmm. um, it, we can agree that the educational system is, is working, um, but what is it working towards? Um, and what do you think the purpose of uh, our educational system at the, at the ground level, at the earliest years, is, uh, is uh, for? There's a difference between the theoretical purpose of education and the actual effect of education. So the theoretical purpose of education is to teach the new generation valuable skills and knowledge that prepare them for the future prepares the next generation for the future. However, the I will concede, or I think there is a discrepancy between that ideal and what actually happens. So what do you think at the most basic level, or um, at the earliest years, the purpose of the educational system is? Like, What are we teaching um, kids to do in, in kindergarten? Um, first grade, second grade? Like, how do we set the foundation for, for knowledge and education? So our previous episode was about society. Mm -hmm. And we talked about how people as a collective have certain desires and work with each other to accomplish or satisfy those desires. One desire that society has is the raising of a new generation to form good and polite or civil civilians. So the one of the fundamental purposes of education is to raise a new generation of citizens, ones that are uh, productive and well-mannered and non-violent, peaceful. So how do we know what the future will look like 5, 10, 15 years from now? Um, and how do we come up with a curriculum um, that prepares them for a future that is, is unsteady or un unknown? Like all institutions, education has evolved throughout the history of mankind. Mm -hmm. I admit that hundreds of years ago, this, uh, the, the public education system was mm -hmm. a novel experiment. No one had ever done it before and there was no precedent. So I'm sure that at that time, no one had a certain or clear idea of how to raise children into productive and uh, peaceful citizens. So, However, okay. through experience, we have more insight into what practices are effective and what practices are ineffective. So, as Sir Ken Robinson brought up, um, during the 19th century, when the focus was industrialism, um, most of the useful subjects for work were at the top of the hierarchy um, because we were trying to prepare our best for vital roles um, in society, and, and we still do that. Um, but I think he's arguing that the um, drawbacks to that were maybe subjects like, um, like dance, drama, uh, many of the arts um, were, were kind of kind of put to the side and 
um, people who could have been very successful in those areas did not pursue those areas for, for whatever reason. Sure, that, that makes sense because people learn skills in order to survive. And if there is no market for dance and uh, art, culture, etc., then people who acquire those abilities are almost setting themselves up for failure. Mm -hmm. Dancing doesn't procure you food. Farming does. And, and there are other jobs that ha uh, ha produce enough value that mm -hmm. society is going to trade in exchange for those services or goods. Yeah. So if you work in a factory and you make a car, people want a car and they're willing to pay for the car. If you go to dance school and you learn how to dance, some people might want to see you dance, but the demand for that is substantially you, lower. You have to be very good. You have yeah. to be very good. You have good. to be excellent. Yeah. It's like when we were talking to, uh, to Eddie. Like mm -hmm. if, you, if you want to succeed in art, you have to be very good. If you want to succeed in music, you have to be very good. If you want to succeed in hip hop, you have to be like, really really good mm -hmm. like in that in that niche um, and and I think that that in itself um, is is why we um, hold those people who, who have achieved that in, in those subjects um, to, uh, to such great status or like their, their celebrity status while um, other people who are very vital to society who um, maybe pursued these most useful subjects that we mentioned um, don't don't get as much uh, much much play or as much notoriety, mm -hmm. but but they're the ones you know uh, finding cures for diseases and, and, and things like that. I wouldn't say that they're more useful. Like uh, in, instead, I would say that it, it has an objective value. Okay. So the objective value of a car is that it can transport you from one location to another faster than otherwise. The objective value of hip hop is mm -hmm. questionable. Like, sure, it can it can make you feel good, yeah. but that in itself is subjective. And I'm not denying that it brings joy to many people's lives. It, some would even call it their purpose in life. It's just that there is a distinction between an objective value and a subjective value, and objective values objective value is easier to commercialize and commoditize. Mm -hmm. No, I, I would agree. Um, now, what about when we combine combine both in, in mm -hmm. a sense. We take something that has a great amount of objective value and we can add artistry to it or we can um, kind of, what's it, what's the company I'm thinking of, like Apple. Exactly, I was thinking that too. Right, um, who, who does a fantastic job of taking something that has a tremendous amount of value to the marketplace, to society, and then they maybe, they maybe hire or pursue a certain type of individual who hasn't had um, artistry um, taken away from or stripped mm -hmm. from them through their educational process. Like that's a special individual um, when, you can, when you can find that person. Um, not that um, people who are only, object, uh, um, only valuable because they're um, a fantastic physicist or mathematician uh, or somebody who's only valuable because they're the best dancer in the world. But if you can find somebody who can put uh, those two together, um, you can um, create companies like, like Apple. Um, mm -hmm. Do we encourage that in our educational system, or is that something that just happens? And those people just are, are spectacular, and um, they will always be there. And we don't need to encourage them. Education, the education system aspires to create the perfect individual. Edu, edu, uh, schools want to endow their students with all the knowledge necessary to solve all the world's problems. So, of course, they would love it if they could help raise someone to do everything you just said. Yeah. But is it feasible? I, I think it's not. It's mm -hmm. it's extraordinarily hard, and it would require such in it would require special attention being given to every single individual, and that's logistically impossible. Yeah. In my opinion, at this time. So you you would agree that. Um to humanize the individual or to humanize the student enhances their ability to add subjective value or artistry to their objective value? It's, it's analogous to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. Initially, a person has to satisfy their physiological needs and mm -hmm. desires. 
considering those to be the objective value that I was referring to earlier, uh, food is object like I, I don't I don't mean just I mean like the raw ingredients for food yeah. that is objectively valuable. The carrot you buy at the supermarket, mm -hmm. um, water, the house you live in, uh, the basic things that those are all objectively valuable. However, once you have them, we innately crave more. So it's not that we are purely objective or we're purely subjective. It's not. Uh, it's not even that there's this sort of ratio that each of us have. It's more like once we have, once we satisfy our objective desires, we our desires evolve so that we seek to satisfy our subjective ones too. Mm -hmm. Three hundred years ago, no one would care if their phone could fit in their pocket. Like they didn't even know about the phone. They just wanted to be able to talk from one. They just wanted to be able to talk to someone on the other side of the planet instantaneously. Mm -hmm. But once we got that, we became hungry for the next best thing, or for, for something better. Mm 